the next will be the international seminar on uh, Buddhism high education and vision. In this session, there will be uh, one speaker uh, from Thailand, and uh, we have known him as the doc, pra, Venerable Dr. Pra Sakaya Wong Wisuti, or we know him as Dr. Anil Sukanto, MPhil from Cambridge University and PhD from Brunel. His Venerable is currently serving as the Deputy Director from for Foreign Affairs of Mahamakut Buddhist University. Venerable Dr. Paranil Sakayaung Visuti, may I humbly invite you to the stage. Most venerables, venerables, and very pious Upasaka and Upasikas, of course, our dear sisters, nuns. This is a very auspicious occasion, and I'm so glad, and I am very thankful for Venerable Dhammasami to be a part of this history in making. Of course, if you look at how Buddhism has been living up to our age is, of course, it is due to education. It is, of course, due to very important way how we keep and practice Buddhism. It is already 2,500 years over. But we do have this Buddhism surviving in a life. And we can proudly say that the Buddhism we are practicing at the moment is a Buddhism, the same version which was practiced by the Buddha. Comparing to other religions, it is very difficult for them to proudly say it. And how it could possible at all for one of the age-old religion as Buddhism, even Hinduism, even Brahminism, which they used to say that's older than, their, older than any other religion, they're even able to keep up with this modern age and then more than application of their religion until they can't keep their religion survive as they used to be. But Buddhism has been able to survive any storms, any fire, any burning of the Mahanalanda University, destruction of country after country, even with the, all the modernization and globalizations, Buddhism still can survive, can stand, as it was at the time of the Buddha. Because Buddha taught that the essence of Buddhist practice, the essence of Buddhist teaching is Sikha Padang. The essence of a Buddhist teaching 84,000 of teachings is the Sikha. So therefore, our way of practicing Buddhism, our way of preserving those noble teachings is by what? By education. Education, the Sikha, which has become an eightfold noble path, which has become a four noble truths, whatever you say it. It's come to the idea of the, what you call a five precepts as even a part of a ritual. But if you understand it clearly, everything boils down to word Sikha Padang. Sikha Padang. Padang is a lesson. Sikha is a to study, educate. Therefore, Buddhism 
is able to survive as it was because of this noble tradition we have been carried on. In the time of the Buddha, it was an oral tradition. With the new technology, we changed from oral tradition to the palm leaf. With even a new tradition, with even a new inventions, we transform those palm leaf to all the book form. And with this new technology, we are putting all our tipitaka in even our palms, in our hands. But the message never changed. But the essence never changed. It is always akaliko. It has been always akaliko. It is beyond the time factor. It is beyond whatever the world changes. The noble truth, the absolute truth, the Arya Satya would be the same. And we have to realize that. We have to learn that. And how do we do that? By education. So therefore, I'm so happy, I'm so delighted to be part of this inauguration that we are prolonging, we are extending our Buddhist tradition again by giving a place, by building a place where we can give a proper education to our new generations. We can give life to a Buddhism, a proper Buddhism. So thank you very much. And then so glad that this is happening in this place, Chan State. Talking about West, it looks though it is very far away from us. From the morning, we have been talking about the education. We have been talking about how we apply Buddhist teaching to a missionary and ministry work. Even going back to the Nalanda, one of the proud of all Buddhists, that we can proudly say that we were the one who established, one who initiated the proper education, proper university in the history of the world, not the West. However, we can just feel proud of our past. Time changes, and then it makes us that nowadays we can glorify our past, but not the present. And this is one of our noble attempt to make our present glorify as it was in the past. And in order to do that, we have to update it us. In order to do that, we have to see what is going on in this world. And that's why the West is important here. The topic Venerable Dhammasami gave to me is Buddhist studies in Europe and America. Actually, I can talk about it for the whole semester. Because I used to teach in America in a different universities. Even the course of the name of the course is Buddhism in the West. And then I can go on for the whole year teaching the same subject. Still not finished. So generally, when we think about the West and Buddhism, it looks like it is very new. It looks like it is something very interesting in a sense that the Western world, Western education system becomes so influential to our way of thinking, to our way of living. Nowadays, whatever this West created, we immediately become victims. We immediately become prey for their invention. Similarly, education is another thing. We try to follow the West. Without knowing that, is that the perfect education system available in this world or not? So when we talk about Buddhist studies, there is two questions very, very serious. I don't know how do I define Buddhist studies. 
Because for general venerable monks, we become a monk. Like I myself, I'm my member of the Masami, we ended become a monk when I were, we, we were just aged at what? 13, 14, in my case 14. I think the Masami was on 12, something like that. And from that time, we have been studying Buddhism in one way or another. I don't know whether we call the schooling Buddhism is only studying or the practice teaching within living with the teachers and learn from that, whether we call it study as a proper study or not. But that has been our tradition has been following on. And shall we call that Buddhist study or not? In Myanmar, Mahaganda Yong, many other monasteries, traditional monastery, and we have just seen the Venerable Tipitaka Acharya, who has been able to memorize whole Tipitaka. Can we call that Buddhist study or not? Of course, from our knowledge, we will call that is a Buddhist study. But I have a problem with that. Because the word Buddhist study happened to be invented and introduced by Western scholar, not by us. So therefore, when we talk about Buddhist study, we have a problem. When we learn Buddhism, we want to call it, this is a Buddhist study. But all this Western guy from somewhere come and say that, no, no, you are not doing the Buddhist study. You are studying the religion. You are following traditions. You are developing your faith. That is a practice of religion, not a Buddhist study. They put us in trap. We went to school. We live by those principles. We, early morning, we go arms around as a part of our livelihood, staying in the monastic schools. And what we study? We study all the Tipitakas, Pali language. Abhidhamma, and even sometimes English, even sometimes math. But somebody from nowhere said that, no, you are not studying Buddhist study. What you are doing is that a study of religion. It's a study of Buddhism in a sense of religiosity, in a sense as a religion. And that's a become problem. So what have we doing? We are not a student of Buddhist study at all. Because these Western scholars thought they define Buddhist study as an academic subject. They didn't regard the way we study Buddhism is a Buddhist study because they say that the way we study Buddhism leading to a believing in Buddhism. And why on earth we have to study? <laughs> I don't know. If you want to study math, become an expert in a math, don't you want to be a mathematician? Similarly, if you are studying in a medical doctors, and don't you want to be a doctor, medical doctor? And what's wrong with us studying Buddhism and want to be a Buddhist scholar? And these guys say that, no, you can't be. Because the way you study is the way it is just like building your faith onto that religion. The way you study that keep your eye closed because you are focused and you are not allowed to sort of a watch here and there. So that is not a Buddhist study. Well, this is a very challenge for us. And suddenly, with this new acceptance of this modern world, 
Virbal Dhammasami says that we have a Nalanda, we have a Takasila, we have a so many other great universities. But we forgot all those. And then we are praising Cambridge, we are praising Oxford. Luckily, happened to be here, the alumni of those two. Dhammasami is from Oxford, and I am from Cambridge. We are in a rivalry. <laughs> and suddenly, we are saying that uh, all Buddhist study has to be defined by those guys, which I'm not sure whether they understand Buddhism or not. But that is the world. And that's why they keep us in trap. So I understand that what you call Buddhist study in Europe and America meant to be something what we define the modern definitions, not the study of religion, not the study of Buddhism. And that's why we divide the monastic traditional education of Buddhism as a study of Buddhism to develop our faith on, to take as our part of our life, but whereas Buddhist study as defined by all Western scholars is something they just study for the sake of knowledge. So that's why we always hear that Buddhism is a philosophy. Although Buddha himself said that Buddhism is not a philosophy in the Tibetaka. But so many scholars in this world, especially Western scholars, say that Buddhism is a philosophy because they don't know what is philosophy and what is reality. They always think that the way we study Buddhism is just for fun, just for knowledge. What is the point? What is the point if you know Tipitaka so well, but you don't do as you learn it? What is the point that you become a very good, ex distinguished medical doctor, but you don't know you don't want and you don't know how to treat or how to heal a patient. What is the point of studying? And that's why I don't know what, that, what these uh, Western means by Buddhist study. They define very clearly that Buddhist study by their means is that just a sake of knowledge. So whether that knowledge can be used in building their faith, building their devotion, building their piety, it is not about Buddhist study. It is something they are personal. It is something they are theoretical. It is something they are practical. It is not Buddhist study. Buddhist study has to be very pure in terms of a theory, in terms of a debating, in terms of a explanation. So that is why we have to define the word Buddhist study from the beginning. Because if we use the Western approach of Buddhist study, we are very new to here. Because in the West, the Buddhist study only started in the early 19th century. Of course, if we go back and look at the Western history of Buddhism, Buddhism has been in the West even before the Christianity. Buddhism has been in the West in every Western culture from the earlier period even before the Christian, even before the Jesus was born. If you go to the Bible, there is a whole chapter of the life of Buddha in Bible. Balaram and Joseph by Damascus. Those Bible was banned, taking the whole chapter out of Bible in the 16th century in Vatican. Knowing just only in the 16th century, they were able to knew that the oh, life of Buddha was in the Bible. <laughs> Buddha was a, one of their prophets. Then they realized that, oh, we have been wrong altogether. So they just withdraw. Before it used to be in the Bible, the Buddhas, they have a Buddha's day, even did. Even in the old in middle, uh, middle East and in the, in the uh, middle period in the European age, they even have uh, the Buddha's day. 
It is on the 26th of November as a part of their prophet. They beautify him as a part of their God or their saint. Buddha was a saint. But in the 16th century, they realized that, oh, they have been worshiping a wrong guy. And they withdraw that sainthood from the Bible. So in the New Testament, the whole chapter is gone. But in Jews, in Old Testament, that tradition is still alive now. If you go to Al-Quran, which again, we always thought that we are two different religions. Even in Al-Quran, there is a mention of the list of the prophet of Allah. In the prophet of Allah, there is a name called Kafalawala. Kafalawala. Basically means that Kapilawala. The one who from Kapilawastu, and that is the Buddha. It was mentioned in the Al-Quran. As their prophet. So, if we go and study all these things, we can see that Buddhism is not an alien religion to the West. It has been there. If you go to look at the Great Britain, UK, even in the nomadic period before the UK has been a UK, these days, the remnants, there is archaeology, there is art which symbolize that Buddhism was there even before the UK is known as a UK. So, for those Western, Buddhism is very new. Although it has been there for a long, long time. Even in the Africa, in the 16th century, the monk was already there in Africa. Not a new thing that African Buddhism is nowadays. We have someone from Uganda, and then it's very new for them. In fact, in South Africa, in the Cape Town, the monks were there in the early 15th, 16th century, already there. So Buddhism has been the aspect of globalizations from the time of the Buddha, and it never stopped. We always refer to the King Asoka for the spreading of Buddhism, but even before that, the Buddhism has been a culture, has been a will which has been going around because the message of Buddhism itself is so pure, is so noble that every culture everywhere they are seeking for, they are looking for. But all those history has been wiped out. And then suddenly says that all the books, like in 16th century, they have been written the, in France, La Lube, he has written a whole book about even the Patimok, even the story of uh, Devadatta in French in the 16th century. There are so many other books, even in the uh, uh, Arabic, in Islamic world. They have a, even a Dhammapada translated into Islamic world. But all those things is not regarded as a part of a Buddhist studies. All of this world, I don't know how they define. They said that this is a, a you know, just not fitting or the kind of uh, not matching sort of a text or literature we can find in all over scattering all over the West. However, suddenly in the 18th century, 19th century, what happened is that the colonialism, when they invade, the Western invade with this technology today, you know, hunting for the states after state to loot all the what do we call resource from our lands. And at that time, they are not only looting the resources, which is a tangible resources, but they also found intangible and invaluable resources, that is Buddhism. So some people it came to the East, starting to collect this art and artifact, making of a gold and this and that. They thought that is valuable. But when they keep it for long, they find more valuable than good, gold is something else hidden behind that artifacts, artifacts the, all the messages. That's why in the Arnold study, they, they wrote the book Light of Asia. It is said that he meant to write actually Light of the World. 
But because of the Christian community really protest that, and so it came down to the light of, the, light of Asia and then trying to put and to present Jesus Christ as the light of the world. It is a political, religious political, rather than anything else. So the Buddhist study in the 18th century, how it started was by this Victorian. They thought that when they come to the Asia, they see the, they, they come to the Myanmar, they go to the Thailand, they go to the Sri Lanka, they go to the India, they go to the China, everywhere, and they try to collect a lot of things called very exotic. Once have that idea, value of exotic, it makes them interested. Just like exotic traveling here and there. And because of that very superficial value, they put it on those culture, religion, what we have been very putting up to the highest level, but they took it as a exotic, they took it as a remnant for their fun to, to do their whatever they want to do. But out of that, things came out that people started, started to study. Out of that, they're trying to learn why they do that. Why they have the artifacts. Why the image of the Buddha is like that. Then, suddenly, the hidden treasures is coming out of that. Why Buddha is always in the very calm face. Even sometime, they said that Buddha is the lazy one, always closing his eyes. And that's why the Buddhists are lazy people, they said. But they started to look at it very closely. And they said that, no, Buddha never, sleep, never closed his eyes. It was only half closed. <laughs> then why it is half closed? Then they started, oh, that is a teaching. Restrain our eyes. Restrain all our senses. So started to have the meaning from those art and artifacts, which they took it back as a part of their fun, part of their collections. Later, when they find that, they find a lot of text. For example, from Nepal, Brian Houghton Hudson, who was the sort of a British ambassador to Kathmandu at the time, to Nepal. And in Nepal at the time, what they were going, that political power was changing. The Hindu was so strong that they want to wipe all Buddhists out of Nepal where Buddha was born. And that autocratic king want to burn all Buddhist texts, which is available in Nepal. And seeing the value of those texts by this Brian Houghton Hudson sends the message to the, all the Buddhists in Nepal, says that, okay, if they come and burn your book, do not let it burn. You hide, because in Nepal it's cold, here like, like, they put in a the soul. They ask that, okay, you hide the book under your armpit, and then pass by the embassy, throw it in the embassy, British embassy. So a lot of Buddhists, in order to keep that Buddhist text survive up to our age, instead of thinking of attachment, we have learned this morning, we have to detach. Inst if we detach, it will be burned down. So they learn how to detach those intangible, it is invaluable texts. They put it, all the women, especially women, they have a soul. They put it, they hide in the armpit and then go pa pa pass by the embassy, throw it in the embassy. Brian Houghton Hudson collected those piles of piles of Buddhist texts which was surviving from the Nalanda period when the Nalanda was burned down, was able to save. And because of this Brian Hutton Hudson, he doesn't know what it's all about. He tried to actually uh, pay some people to translate some of the text. And one of these Western educators is that uh, he's not a translator only. He get a translation and he went and asked, is that something like that? And then he added on to the translator again in a lot of notes he made it from his own personal observations. And that is the quality of Western scholarship sometimes we need it. And all those texts were sent it to the England, to the USA, and to the France, of many. And all those texts really intrigued the Western scholars. What is all about this? It is very interesting. They started to learn the languages. They become experts in the Pali, as the previous 
presenter said it. Rich Davis came as a lawyer, worked as a lawyer in the Sri Lanka, but he ended up going back as a Pali scholar. I don't know. It's called a success or failure of his job. <laughs> he was not able to do any lawyer job in Sri Lanka, but he was educated, become a Pali scholar, and then started new thing, new world. So many of those texts started to have a lot of value apart from being the old text, architectures, archaeology, kind of in terms of artifacts. All those manuscripts started to intrigue those scholars. And they studied. Before, there was a only bit and pieces. And that's why they didn't call it Buddhist study. They call it one of the book, authors, or written, or whatever it is called, a record. But once they have a text, they started to analyze those texts. And that is a Western scholarship. We study the text, and we say, this is a very good text. You should read it. And when we teach to others, we will teach by pace by pace, not missing any words. And this is an Asian mentality, Asian way of teaching. Even memorize a word by word. But those Western scholarship didn't do that. They studied. And then they put, why? The same thing, it was said in one sutta, one discourse is something else, the other is something else. What's wrong there? They didn't say that which text is wrong or right, but they went and trying to find the, what they call, mix, they're trying to find the joints, the networking. Why they said like that? Why this is said like that? So they have this comparative, analytical process to the oldest texts and then make this original text make him so juicy. The dry original text becomes so juicy, so delicious. Even one page of a Buddhist text, they can come out with a very fat, novel book. Even a one, you know, even in the Bamiyan, they found a one, you know, just a piece of paper with a piece of palm leaf. They can make it a whole book out of that. And this is what we call this a Buddhist, Buddhist study. So that's why in France, the Brian Hudson sent it, and the, the guy called Eugene Bernoff, who has been studying Sanskrit texts before and has been doing some of the writing, suddenly he was shocked by all those texts which were sent from Nepal. And then he went through, he, you know, all his world is you know, sort of a shut down, and then he was happy with those texts, and then trying to study Pali, another language, after adding to the Sanskrit. And then he, st he, he started to wrote a book called Introduction a la History Indian Buddhism, which is the introduction of Indian Buddhism. The first book from the Western world regarded as the one of the first book of Buddhist study. So, the whole idea of Buddhist studies was started in 1844 by the publication of that book. Even before that, he has written some book, but it was not regarded as Buddhist study. Not only that, there was another book later on about the Pali languages. Then slowly, one after another coming out, and then they started to call Buddhist studies because they thought that when they wrote that book, it doesn't affect the ideas of the one who write or one who read that. It means that uh, it was for pure sake of knowledge. They are just doing the job that, okay, this text, that text, not putting their idea into it. Maybe they put it for sure, I guess. But they call that, no, they are just trying to justify everything text without their personality, without their personal theory, without their personal belief. And that's why it is called Buddhist text, or Buddhist study. And suddenly, the study of Buddhism changed drastically in the West. Suddenly, it's become a very delicious dessert for these Western scholars. And again, in if, you're talking, if you are talking about the Europe in a sense that uh, England, Professor Rhys Davis happened to be the first chair in Manchester University. And his chair was comparative religion. 
And in comparative religion, he is a scholar of Theravada Buddhism. And he started to teach comparative religion. He started to chair comparative religion, which again, by the time passed by, comparative religion become obsolete in these days. We can't call it now. It has changed, it has developed itself to a religious study. So that's why when we talk about Buddhist study these days, Buddhist study is regarded as a subset of a religious study. So in a way that when we teach religion, when we teach Buddhism, it is not a sake for a learner to become a religionist, a religiosity, or to believe in a religion, but to let them analyze by themselves about religion. Once they themselves, they realize it. If you want to be a Buddhist, it is up to you. It has nothing to do with your study now. They try to divide between the, draw the line, life, way of life, and the knowledge. And that's why I said that in the beginning that I have a problem with these people. Because when we think about Buddhism, Buddhism is all about the tisika, educating what? Educating the sila, educating the samadhi, educating the panya. And what is sila, samadhi, panya? Sila is education of society. Samadhi is education of self. Panya is education of intellectual. And what is in total, it is a balancing all those things. Because self cannot be surviving self. You have to live in society. And how you live in society with a balance of intellectual property. So those are the teachings in the Buddha which have to be reflected upon your life. But based on Buddhist studies, in the Western Buddhist studies, it is not. Okay, so this is, I think, only background. That's why I, can t I told you that I can go on for the whole uh, semester for this. This is just only about Buddhist studies. So, so I will just give you a very brief, uh, I think the time is up, so I have a very brief idea as to what is going on. So generally, if we talk about the Buddhist study, if we talking about in the England, for Europe, uh, Europe, for example, they divide the Buddhist study into three schools, three group categorized. One is that Anglo-German, which means that uh, English and German sort of stock. And other is a Franco-Belgian. And later on, uh, Ninian Smart started, uh, someone started the Leningrad, Leningrad School. What is these differences? The difference is that the first group, Anglo-German, mostly study in the Pali text. They use most Pali uh, resources. Whereas the Franco-Belgian mostly rely on Sanskrit text. And then the Leningrad, also basically on a Sanskrit text, they also develop so many other kind of a regional texts, as a, for example, Burmese text, Japanese text, and Chinese text, and so on. So these are the three main sort of a Buddhist studies uh, those Western scholars divide, categorize. In America, again, it started in the 1984, by the Dhammapala in the Chicago Parliament of World Religion in Chicago. And that's how they spark the whole idea of Buddhism in America. By the Anagarika Dhammapala and then Suzuki from Japanese Buddhism and so and so. And suddenly the, the Paul Karus started to write the gospel on, of the Buddha by associating with the Anagarika Dhammapala. And suddenly the light of Buddhism, you know, brightened up in America. And suddenly, again, there are so many others. Of course, one of the, another important is the Alcott. We can't forget that. But those are not regarded as a father of Buddhist study. Father of Buddhist study started to have the very great impact on education and universities. So these days, to, to keep it very short, these days you have so many other... Uh, schools and universities. Nowadays in the West, if your university doesn't provide the Buddhist study, it's a very, what do you call this, archaic. It's very not fashionable at all. Nowadays, to study Buddhism is a very fashionable, very new trend in the West. I am a professor, a visiting professor in an in a American university. And in American University, which is actually Jesuit University even, but my course there, Buddhism, is one of the most 
money-making course for the university. Because when they knew that I'm going to teach there, within half an hour, my class will be full. Sometimes they will ask that, would you mind open a new class? So I was there, and I'm there already. So OK, fine. So I teach the same course again for sometimes two classes, because they want to open it, because the university get money after that. And then my class is very full. Whereas Christian class, they opened, no one signed for that. And they extend your time. <laughs> we are going to extend the time for the signing the class. Again, no one. And finally, they close the, <laughs> they close the class. But whereas in Buddhist class, oh, more and more they want it. So I started to have that. And after one class, I have to start a new class, different class. And anything with Buddhism, oh, immediately it attracts the interest. Even nowadays, Buddhism has been developed. Buddhist study in the West in developed. In the beginning, it was a philological. It's based on a language I mentioned. But nowadays, not in a language. The Buddhism has been gone into the every main major subjects. Psychology. I teach in the psychology department as well. And those psychology department in the West say that the psychology wouldn't fulfill unless they take the Buddhist course, you see. The, all the scientific psychology is gone to the tray, ashtray now. They have to have a Buddhist course. Otherwise, they wouldn't call psychology these days. In the science now, neurologists, they are studying Buddhism in order to understand the neurology. In terms of a, another new thing is that the mind, mind sight, even the new word, they have coined a new word. We have, we have insight, but the for, uh, this, this American now invented the word mind sight. Mind sight is generally what? It is a connection between the, these three, sila, samadhi, and prajna. So they have a new word to make it very Western. And thinks that they are the something well, they knew well. Sorry, you should come and learn from our venerable monks here. Then you will know how stupid you are. But these are the things going on. So now every university in West, in America, the Buddhism is one of the most profitable subject in America. So they have changed, you see. Buddhism, Buddhist studies, not for the believing, not for the personal gain, but for the money matter. So they use Buddhism as a label to earn money. So that's why we have been teaching Buddhism for ages. We can't sell even one book. But in America, yes, good, wake up. Uh, just look at this. Just for America, this is only about Buddhism in America. Sometime in our country, if you want to find a good book about Buddhism in Myanmar, might be difficult to get one. Buddhism in Thailand, very difficult to get one. But look at American Buddhism is not even 50 years. <laughs> but they have piles of Buddhist books already there, writing everything. Even teaching Buddhism in the West. So you have the whole book about how do you teach Buddhism in the West, which university provide what. You have even the book, A Brief History of Buddhist Study in Europe and America. So I don't want to just summarize this book. <laughs> it will be very heavy. You have a lot of books called State of Buddhist Study in the World. Even the modern, the latest is a Western Dharma which has, they, pro they, they provide, they say that Buddhism is become now Americanized Buddhism. <laughs> British Buddhism, they even disregard us now. They say that Theravada Buddhism is not a pure religion, not a pure Buddhism. <laughs> Mahayana Buddhism is not pure Buddhism. Buddhism in Myanmar is not a pure Buddhism, not right. The pure Buddhism is American Buddhism now. <laughs> The pure Buddhism is British Buddhism now. And you have the whole level already. Just like uh, Ambedkar in India called Navayana, uh, Buddhayana, now they have uh, American Buddhism. They can proudly say that this is our religion. Good for them. But they miss a lot by Buddhist study. The technology, the technique, it is good. So just to give a very brief is that you can see that in world, 
in Switzerland in 1975, they established called International Association of Buddhist Studies in 1975. And word Buddhist study introduced in our university is all from their sort of uh, influence. Because in Mahamukut Mahachula, we didn't have a Buddhist study before. We even afraid to call Buddhism. We call faculty of philosophy and what? Religion. Just only recently, we started to say that the faculty of Buddhism. But before not, we call it philosophy. We call it religion. But because all those Western, now they are so proud of calling Buddhism, which gave us some of the braveness <laughs> to call our religion a Buddhism now. So this is what is the impact of our Western Buddhism. So they have now in the world, International Association of Buddhist Studies, where they have a scholars from all renowned world universities, over 500. Every two years they meet each other and they go and meet each other, over 500 Buddhist scholars. And what they do? They have a Buddhist scholars in every discipline. Buddhism from the science, Buddhism from the archaeology, Buddhism from the history, Buddhism from the sociology, Buddhism from anthropology. Now every major subject in this world without, they can't live without Buddhism. But we in turn, trying to learn those subjects and leaving Buddhism behind. <laughs> so, I guess that, uh, you know, I won't go for long, just to give you a very brief idea. So these days, you have those in the world as a European. In America, they have, uh, again, uh, they have a committee like that, like in Europe, and they gather all their uh, scholarships there, Buddhist scholarship there. They have nowadays... Apart from that, in, even in uh, Britain, they call uh, UK Association of Buddhist Study. Again, in, if you go to the, their website, you will see that which university offer what Buddhist course in UK, whole over UK and Ireland. So you have those things already now. It is only shame for us that uh, in our university, in our school, we hardly teach Buddhism, and it is very difficult for us to put Buddhism into the curriculum. Whereas in the West, they are booming at the moment. In schools in the UK, in the schools in North America, every day, over two, three hundred schools, they have a Buddhism there. I have a lot of clips I can show, but I wouldn't do that because we don't have enough time. Uh, mindfulness become a new subject for them. In Oxford, they have a mindfulness center now, where they combine neurology, where they combine psychology, where they combine Buddhism to a new subject and called mindfulness. So I guess that not that long, we'll have a new subject in this world called mindfulness subject. And the mindfulness will what? It is a Buddha. It's a Buddhism. So they will label a new name, and they say that we are the inventor of Buddhism. So this is the influence of Buddhist study in the West. Uh, in Oxford, Venerable Dhammasami is a part of that. Study started to teach Pali there. And then now started the whole idea of the Oxford Center of Buddhist Study. I just recently uh, helped to set up another first Theravada uh, institutions, Theravada Center in Michigan University. Uh, because generally, otherwise, we'll have a Theravada and have it just Buddhism. We have a Tibetan Buddhism. You have a this Buddhism, that Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism. And uh, in terms of a Thai Buddhism, Myanmar Buddhism, we are not that great enough. It is just a part of an anthropological study. But we were now, with their demand, we were able to set up the Theravada Institution as an academic institution under the Michigan University. So they have already have a professorship in the Theravada Buddhism now. In England, Professor Peter Harvey is the only one professor of Buddhism of England they look over all our professors here <laughs> who have been living as a Buddhist professor. <laughs> but they call Professor Buddhism, and they got, they, they got recognition, and what they are doing is a very great job, is that they were able to apply Buddhist teaching to the every section of our life. They were able to find Buddhist answer in a very applicable way to every problem. Unlike us, we still have a problem. We put the Buddhist junk 
part in one way, problem in one way. We said that, you see, there is something there, but we are not able to exactly pinpoint what is a problem, how we solve. But all these Western scholars, when they did that, they throw the Buddhism away, they throw the problem away, they come up with new ideas. So even in politics, uh, uh, the economics, I was, last two years, I was invited in the United Nations to teach, to give a keynote for all the scholars and the businessmen about new economic paradigm. I say, why you invite me? I am not a man. I even don't know how to handle the money because I was ordained from the novice suit. And they said, no. We have search, and then you are the right man we, mon- we want. They won't say that I, you are the right monk. <laughs> you are the right man we are looking for. And then when I was there, I have to talk to this, all these very famous business people about how to do business without knowing what is business. <laughs> so this is what Buddhism, greatness of Buddhism, and then how the world in the Western world finding that gem, the value of that gem, whereas in our country we hold our gem, but we don't know the value of it. And then because of that, we need to have these kind of universities able to polish that gem and then shine the ray out of that gem for the sake of humanity, for the sake of the world. And that's why I salute the attempt of putting, inventing, and starting this new university, bringing the strength of the Western approach of education, bringing the strength of our resource and the way of our study, the Eastern, putting together in a one uh, perfections and which we are really lacking of. Thank you very much, and then hope that this will success and give a real sort of um, in uh, what we call this encouragement for every one of us. Thank you very much. Sato, sato. Thank you very much sir, for enlightening us about Buddhism in America and Europe. Hope we all clear now uh, why Buddhist study and why Buddhist study in the West. And now we are going to uh, the most venerable Dr. Samasama view present the token appreciation to venerable Dr. Pa Sakayavi Suti. Thank you. Venerable Dr. Sakayavi Suti is going to present uh, the token appreciation to our founder, Dr. Thomas, we all started together. Thank you.